Good evening. My name is Erwani Ramugondo. I'm the chair of the Academic Freedom Committee at the University of Cape Town. Welcome to the 2019 TB Devi Lecture. A day after we learned about the passing of a literary giantess and beautiful mind, Professor Toni Morrison, may her soul rest in peace. As a play scholar who introduced intergenerational perspectives in play scholarship for both occupational therapy and occupational science, I'm always intensely pleased when I see a healthy mix of generations in the audience for an important lecture such as this one. Like play within the home, a village, or general society, the academic project can only be sustained when scholars across generations learn from each other and sometimes together. This lecture is made possible through much hard work behind the scenes and great generosity from the Office of the Vice-Chancellor, the Communications and Marketing Department, CMD, as well as members of the Academic Freedom Committee, many of whom are here tonight. I'd like to thank, in particular, Colleen Jephtha from CMD for working closely with me on our speaker's itinerary so that he lands safely and is easily settled in Cape Town. I will now hand over to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Mamukheti Pakeng, to welcome you officially to UCT. Colleagues, good evening. Professor Elelwani Ramugondo, Chair of the Academic Freedom Committee, and all other members of the Academic Freedom Committee, students, colleagues, UCT alumni in the audience, and all of you, ladies and gentlemen, in the hall. Good afternoon to Mel Lang, San Bonani Moluen. What does academic freedom mean in the world and on our university campuses here in South Africa and elsewhere in the world? And in the context of social media, fake news, and everything else that's happening around the world today, who gets to practice academic freedom, and how do they practice it? Who sets the boundaries for what we say and how we say it? Should there be boundaries at all, even? Is academic freedom allowed to use language that some would consider vulgar or offensive to certain groups? Are we allowed to speak out against a religious or demographic group, or only against what the group does? How do we ensure that free thought, exploration of ideas, and creativity in thought, creativity in thought, thought processes are protected? How do we advance the freedom of speech but strip away the individual agendas, party politics, narrow and specific ideologies, so as to encourage free, explorative, and brave critical thinking? How do we do that in our context today? These questions, and many others, are something that we need to examine carefully and think about deeply. Each of these questions is deep and complex, not just for us as a university or as an academic institution, but for us as a society that is changing rapidly, with technology that makes it possible to tell the world with a quick message on our cell phone what we are feeling and doing at any moment. We can do that and we can influence what people think do at any one time. When that kind of reach is available to anyone with, mobile, with a mobile device, do the principles of academic freedom still apply? And how do they apply? What is our responsibility as commentators in traditional and social media, in our academic papers, in our conversations with others in the university, to uphold those principles? And of course, an important question is whether some proponents of academic freedom are more equal than others. 
I'm standing here, colleagues, to welcome you to the 53rd TB Davy Memorial Lecture at the University of Cape Town. But my task is not as simple as it sounds. Although I'm happy to welcome you, because this annual event is a celebration of academic freedom, and academic freedom matters for what we do and how we do it. Those two words, academic and freedom, sound very simple in themselves. But academic freedom is actually highly complex, difficult to navigate, and can lead to deep conflict and distress. And the questions I have just asked are just a small, superficial, perhaps, indication of the kinds of debates around the world about the meaning and practice of academic freedom. And let me just give you a few examples of the variety of debates currently taking place in different countries in the world regarding academic freedom. In Ghana, leaders of higher education are currently arguing with the president of their country about whether the draft public universities bill will undermine the academic freedom of public universities. In China, this year marks the anniversaries of two political movements involving students and scholars in uh, uh, scholars involving students and scholars the may 4th movement of 1919 which challenged traditional chinese values and demanded freedom of speech and democracy and the and the brutal government action against protesters who mobilized in defense of freedom of speech and democratic values in tiananmen square in 1989 scholars who criticize the current government in china still come, come under attack today in the US, the American Association of University Professors voted at its, annual, at its annual meeting in June this year to censor two universities for alleged, alleged violation of academic freedom and Turner. Closer to home, here at UCT, the executive is currently conducting a consultative process on a Senate resolution to support an academic boycott against Israeli academic institutions operating in occupied Palestinian territories, as well as other Israeli academic institutions, enabling gross human rights violations in occupied Palestinian territories. These are just a few examples of the examination of academic freedom and its practice. And I believe such an examination is a very positive step. The power of academic freedom is that it welcomes the need for change and dissent. It honors different vo points of view it is a space we need to cultivate, not just once a year at the TB Davy Memorial Lecture, but constantly. Academic debate, its freedoms and responsibilities, are at the heart of a university. If we are going to use this space honestly, then we need to use it to examine and critique ourselves, not only the other, but ourselves. More than that, our voices must be raised on behalf of those who cannot speak out for themselves. Not the ones who can speak out for themselves who are only far away from us, but even those who are very close to us. In fact, more importantly, for those who are very close to ourselves. Arguments and debate are not negative. Voicing disagreements can be a sign of trust, a way of honoring one another by putting our views into the open. We need to be proud that UCT is a place of challenging ideas and of activism. Not only when we disagree with an unjust government, not just by, by carrying signs, but by being informed, by being responsible citizens who hold our leaders and hold ourselves accountable. The primary principle of academic freedom, in my view, is respect. Not only listen, but also hear the intent of the other speaker and not only ourselves. We will not always come to agree on important issues, and this is a good thing. We do not want everyone to think the same. However, we must practice, we must practice the art of respectful listening. Sometimes we can learn to find the middle ground, to come to a resolution that accommodates and even celebrates our differences. This kind of disagreement can lead to building a community instead of fragmenting us. We need to learn how to create peace with those who disagree with us. Let me thank all of you for attending this lecture today. And perhaps assume that if you're attending the lecture today, you are one of those who's willing to build peace with us.
because we need to have peace with us, not because we agree, but because it's important for our way forward. More importantly, let me say thank you to Professor Ramugondo and all members of the Academic Freedom Committee for opening this UCT platform to a different voice today. I look forward to the lecture and I invite Professor Ramugondo to introduce us to our guest speaker today. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, for that welcome and introductory remarks about academic freedom in present times. And greetings once more. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you tonight for the 2019 TB Devi Lecture on Academic Freedom, Dr. Stephen Salaita. Stephen is an American scholar, author, activist, and public speaker. He's the former Edward Said Chair for American Studies at the American University of Beirut. Stephen is a prolific writer with eight widely known books. Anti-Arab Racism in the USA, Where It Comes From and What It Means for Politics, published in 2006, which went on to win him the 2007 Gustavus Myers Award under the category Outstanding Book from the Center for the Study of Bigotry and Human Rights. The Holy Land in Transit, Colonialism and the Quest for Canaan, published in 2006. Arab American Literary Fictions, Cultures and Politics, published in 2007. The Uncultured Wars, published in 2008. Modern Arab American Fiction, A Reader's Guide, published in 2011. Israel's Dead Soul, published also in 2011. Uncivil Rights, Palestine and the Limits of Academic Freedom, published in 2015. And Internationalism, Decolonizing Native America and Palestine, published in 2016. The last title is particularly important for us in South Africa, given the debate on decolonization that was forced onto the nation's consciousness through Rose Musfall. You will note a consistent thread in the choice of speakers we have presented to you as the Academic Freedom Committee since 2017 to help us engage with what academic freedom might mean from a decolonial perspective. While Professor Mahmoud Mamdani helped us locate the contemporary university within a long-standing Western-led colonial civilizing mission, Professor Pumla Gola reminded us about the dangers of criminalizing dissent. Stephen fits very well within this attempt to reappraise the notion of academic freedom in our current context. For developing this clear thread in the choice of speakers for the TB Devi lecture in recent years, some have accused the Academic Freedom Committee and UCT in general of allowing a new orthodoxy, whilst others suggest that decolonization is still difficult to grasp as a concept and lacks clear practical articulation into action within the academy. These contradictory critiques are healthy and perhaps very telling, and in time will surely produce interesting and generative scholarship. Our invitation of Stephen to give the 2019 TB Devi lecture caused much consternation in some quarters there are letters the Vice Chancellor, Stephen himself, and I received raising concerns. The only letter from a member of the current university community, a student, raised the point that in the VC desk sent out about the lecture, the speaker was presented as having been offered a tenured position at the University of Illinois while it is publicly available knowledge that this offer was revoked. 
I was pleased that the student felt he could write to the vice chancellor and myself as the chair of the Academic Freedom Committee directly. In my response to the student, I agreed with him that the advert indeed did not tell a complete story about the conditional offer to Dr. Stephen Salaita for professorship that was later rescinded by the University of Illinois, explaining at the same time the limitation of a brief advert to share a whole resume about a speaker. Just as similarly, we could not add the part that Stephen was now a school bus driver in the United States of America. Stephen, the title of your talk, The Inhumanity of Academic Freedom, is intriguing and provocative, as it juxtaposes an obvious evil with an assumed good. I want to add that since your nomination and full endorsement by the Academic Freedom Committee for you to be our 2019 TB Davis speaker, I've gone back several times to YouTube to the lecture you gave in 2017 at a conference on academic freedom at the University of Dublin in Ireland. In listening to that talk, I've been struck by the level of resonance I felt regarding local struggles here in South Africa and on the continent and key lessons that really hit home for me. I will cite two of these lessons here. The first lesson has to do with the need to refuse to deny ourselves human emotion, especially anger, whenever we witness gross atrocities. Recognizing that anger or rage in response to dominant aggression is part of our full claim to humanity as oppressed people of the world. The second lesson has to do with how real power lies with those who control public opinion. Their ability to deceive and to feign victimhood while sustaining dominance and privilege is where true evil lies. The powerful, using levers of power within and outside the academy sustain oppression when we allow ourselves to no longer see suffering where it exists, and when we are fooled into thinking that everyday human struggles have nothing to do with us academics. As I watched and listened again to the Dublin lecture earlier today, I was reminded of Dr. Stella Nyanzi, a researcher and academic, now serving time in prison in Uganda, only because she dared call the president, Mr. Yoweri Museveni, a pair of buttocks, because he failed to deliver on a promise made during a campaign trail to provide school girls with free sanitary pads. I was reminded again of the constant deception in present day South Africa lulling us into concerning ourselves with the likes of Penny Sparrow, whose only sin was her inability to conceal hatred through speech acts, while true evil in South African society lies in the systemic mechanisms through which coloniality, structural racism, and gross economic inequality are intertwined and sustain each other. Scholars across generations, please welcome to the podium, Dr. Stephen Salaita. Please let me know if my voice isn't coming through the microphone well. Um, I, I can move my face closer or, or further away as needed. Just um, give me a signal or a shout out, please. Um, before I begin, I, I want to 
offer my uh, profound gratitude to the community here for coming out and, and joining us in this event. And I know that it was a little bit of a, uh, an ugly evening, and so I, I hope the journey will have been worth your while. Thank you very much. I want to thank the Vice Chancellor, the Academic Freedom Committee, really everybody who had a, a hand in putting this together. I'm deeply grateful for the hospitality. Um, the people in whose care I've been have been remarkably kind and, and generous and have made me feel truly at, at home, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Before I begin with my prepared comments, I want to just say a few things, because um, to, to clarify some of the things I'm going to reference vis-a-vis -vis the University of Illinois, on August 2nd, 2014, I received an email just days before I was, begin, was to begin a, a professorship in American Indian Studies at the University of Illinois, notifying me that, that the, the job had been canceled, essentially. Um, the AAUP, other groups, uh, conceptualized it, the court conceptualized it as um, a firing, an academic firing. It ended up, for that year at least, being a huge story in academe in the United States. And really, uh, the story was broader than academe. I, I, I ended up the subject of, of, of news stories for, for quite a while, and it was a bizarre feeling to me, and it remains bizarre to this day, when sometimes when I go back and look at the things that people were writing about that period of my life, it was, it was a little bit it's strange. But um, I ended up um, suing the University of Illinois. The case was in, in court for I don't remember the details, around eight or nine months. It ended in a settlement in, in my favor. At the time, I was at the American University of Beirut, and I was unable to find another academic job. A lot of people have tried since 2014 to, to, to get me a job. A lot of faculty have organized to get me an academic job, but somewhere along the way, those attempts always get shut down. And so in the United States, as you probably know, we don't have um, a public health insurance option. And so basically, after Beirut, I was back in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., not working. Family didn't have health insurance. And so I ended up training to become a school bus driver. And I've been driving a school bus since December, so I guess for about uh, eight, nine months now. And um, that is what I will go back to doing um, next week when I return to the United States. But. My having left academe was, was not ultimately my choice. It was a necessity based on a very uh, uh, rigorously enforced blacklist, you could say, that uh, no university administrator in North America or elsewhere wanted to face the kind of controversy that would attend to offering me a job. So I'll make reference to that in, in, in my talk, and that's what I'm talking about. Now, I begin with a straightforward proposition. Academic freedom is inhumane. Its inhumanity isn't of the physical, legal, or intellectual variety. Even at its best, academic freedom is capable of transforming human beings into instruments of bureaucracy. It is inhumane as an ontological category. It cannot provide the very artifact it promises freedom. To become practicable, academic freedom requires textual boundaries. Under this sort of regime, freedom is merely academic. Freedom in a rights-based structure is easy to visualize, which means that it's tethered to orthodoxy. This doesn't make a rights-based structure unimportant. It is something to be strengthened and preserved. It merely peters out somewhere short of freedom. Academic freedom can do little to alter the fine-tuned cultures of obedience that govern nearly every campus around the world. I cannot venture a comprehensive theory of freedom or know for certain in what spaces freedom may be possible, but it won't be in selective institutions possessed of wealthy donors legislative overseers, defense contracts, and opulent endowments. 
If you'll grant me the patience, I'll recall a few of my experiences in and beyond academe in an effort to illuminate these points. A few years ago, after my lawsuit with the University of Illinois had been settled, but before I left academe, I visited a US campus to speak about academic freedom. The itinerary included a thought session with the local AAUP. The AAUP, for those unfamiliar with the acronym, is the American Association of University Professors, a venerable organization that more or less sets the criteria for academic freedom and investigates cases where it appears to have been violated. Its influence extends beyond the USA. As an organization, the AAUP opposes academic boycott of Israeli universities, but intervened strongly on my side after the Illinois firing. Rather than a discussion or even an argument about what academic freedom means for Israel's critics, the gathering of faculty ended up being a kind of inquest. The gentleman who had convened the round table read some of my provocative tweets without mentioning the horrors to which they responded, and then compared them against relevant sections of the AAUP manual. I confess to having been annoyed. By that point, I no longer thought about the tweets. I couldn't recall my state of mind when I wrote them and had published an entire book defending them. More important, numerous bodies had already declared my case a clear-cut violation of academic freedom. Dozens of scholarly associations, various committees at the University of Illinois, labor unions, a federal judge, individual theorists of free speech, the AAUP itself. It didn't seem useful to relitigate a historical episode contested only by fascists and reactionaries. Listening to my words interspersed with itemized bylaws was jarring, but it helped clarify an ethic that's normally implicit. When I make a public comment, I don't care if it conforms to the etiquette of a speech manual. I'm instead concerned with the needs and aspirations of the colonized, the unempowered, the dispossessed. Conditioning critique on the conventions of bourgeois civil liberties and in deference to specters of recrimination abrogates any meaningful notion of political independence. To ignore those conventions, to engage the world based on a set of fugitive values will necessarily frustrate centers of power in ways that require protection beyond the scope of academic freedom. The damnable comment is precisely what academic freedom attempts to protect, but it is incapable of preventing unsanctioned forms of punishment regulation of the job market according to docility, or the increasing contingency of labor, which stands today as the greatest threat to academic freedom. Human beings are too complicated for rule books. Problem is, we're also too unruly for freedom. In institutions trained on reproducing social order, rule books will always win that battle. In order to productively discuss academic freedom, we first need to determine the nature of the product we're discussing. I don't want to recite arguments anyone who bothered to attend this lecture almost surely agrees with. Academic freedom preserves democracy. Academic freedom emboldens research. Academic freedom facilitates faculty governance. These by now are truisms. Academic freedom is no simple matter, though. We have distinct ways of understanding it, often according to class, discipline, race, gender, and ideology. At base, academic freedom entitles us, as both faculty and students, to say or investigate things that might upset others without the fear of retaliation. As with any condition of speech, limits exist. And as always, complexity begins at the imposition of limits. Many people, for example, are unwilling to protect a Nazi's right to teach undergraduates. Others believe that the principle of speech overrides the harm attending to the Nazi's presence. Using Nazis as a hypothetical scenario used to be considered overkill, but these days, unfortunately, it requires no hyperbole. 
let's grant the argument that the Nazi has to go. We don't want racism on campus, right? But what happens when a Jewish student says criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic? or when a white student considers affirmation of blackness a form of racial hostility. We've been warned again and again that limiting the reactionary speech will inevitably lead to repression of the political left. This is the absolutist view of academic freedom, the belief that protection ought to be evenly applied across the ideological spectrum. It's a solid view. I have no fundamental problem with it but I do question the wisdom of allowing a civil liberty to dominate notions of freedom. In the end, we have to apply value judgments mediated by lawless forces to balance speech rights with public safety. In societies like the USA and South Africa, steeped in the afterlives of colonization, the task is remarkably difficult. We know that racism is bad, but global economic systems are invested in its survival. We know that anti-Zionism isn't racism, that in fact it's the just position, yet no agreement exists about what comprises appropriate speech, in large part because maintaining a community is at odds with corporate dominion. As a result, there's no way to prioritize a set of beliefs without accusations of hypocrisy or without actual hypocrisy. The easy answer is to protect speech equally and let a marketplace of ideas sort the winners and losers. There's a catch, though. Value judgments don't arise in a vacuum, and discourses don't exist in a free market. Structural forces, often unseen, always beneficial to the elite, determine which ideas are serious and which in turn get a hearing. If we conceptualize speech as a market-driven phenomenon, then we necessarily relinquish concern for the vulnerable. We're left with competing narratives in a system designed to favor the needs of capital. It's a highly lopsided competition. Those who humor the ruling class will always enjoy a strong advantage, which aspiring pundits and prospective academics are happy to exploit. Corporate and state-run media don't exist to ratify disinterest, but to reproduce status quos. The political left is already restricted on and beyond campus. The same notions of respectability or common sense that guide discussion of academic freedom also limit the imagination to mechanical defense of abstractions. Sure, academic freedom is meant to protect insurgent politics, and often does, but the milieu in which it operates has plenty of ways to neutralize or quash insurgency. I focus on radical ideas because Palestine, one of my interests and the source of my persecution, belongs to the set of issues considered dangerous by polite society, at least in North America and much of Europe, and for that matter, the Arab world. Others include black liberation, indigenous nationalism, open borders, decolonization, trans-inclusivity, labor militancy, communism, radical ecology, and anti-imperialism. Certain forms of speech reliably cause people trouble, condemning the police, questioning patriotism, disparaging whiteness, promoting economic redistribution, impeaching the military, Anything really that conceptualizes racism or inequality as a systemic problem rather than an individual failing. More than anything, denouncing Israeli aggression has a long record of provoking recrimination. Anti-Zionism has always existed in dialogue with revolutionary politics around the globe, including the long struggle against apartheid. Academic freedom doesn't prevent sexual violence. It doesn't disrupt racial capitalism. It doesn't hinder obscene inequality. Academic freedom isn't a capable deterrent to genocide. The devotee of academic freedom will say that it's not meant to do any of those things. This is correct. Academic freedom has humbler ambitions. The fact that academic freedom has a specific mandate doesn't 
detract from its importance. I'm not attempting to convince you to dispose of academic freedom. I'm suggesting that it shouldn't be the limit of your devotion. I've been tracking Anglophone academic job listings for five years, monitoring them for 20, and have yet to see the word Palestine in a single advertisement. There's also precious little about Pakistan, Nigeria, Indonesia, Brazil, and South Africa. Israel, on the other hand, is the subject of endowed professorships across the globe. Why does this comparatively minuscule country, in both size and population, enjoy such prominence on campus? The obvious answer is that the state's supporters spend money on professorships. This explanation isn't comprehensive, though. Lots of factors exist. The importance of Israel to US culture and identity, Israel's prominent role in Western imperialism, the pro-Israel leanings of many professors and administrators, the state's seamless reproduction of orthodoxy, the notion that Israel is exceptional and thus worthy of special study, the methodical effort to scrub Palestinians from the globe. The last point, the decades-long attempt to scrub Palestinians is critical. Zionists have made it so that even identifying as Palestinian is contentious. Articulating nationalist politics, a central feature of Palestinian identity, is likely to inspire remonstration. It's an awful predicament. In spaces devoted to learning, inquiry into our very existence is verboten. We cannot claim a history. We cannot share our culture. We cannot speak without oversight. My life in academe, as both a student and teacher, was defined by the tyranny of balance, the idea that no criticism of Israel can stand on its own, and that my obligation was to internalize the oppressor's feelings rather than interrogate my own. As I grew and met more people, I learned that my experiences were exhaustingly common. Last year, Palestine Legal, an organization that assists people on campus targeted for punishment by Zionists, responded to 289 incidents of suppression of US-based Palestine advocacy. In 2017, the number was 318. Since 2014, Palestine Legal has responded to a total of 1,247 incidents of suppression. The number of actual incidents is no doubt much higher. Upon becoming president, Donald Trump appointed Kenneth Marcus as head of the Office for Civil Rights at the Department of Education. Marcus is a Likudnik who founded the Louis Brandeis Center for Human Rights, which has dragged dozens of pro-Palestine activists into court, including myself. To this day, not a single university president has condemned the University of Illinois' 2014 annihilation of academic freedom or its destruction of the program in American Indian studies. Eight months earlier, hundreds found time to bemoan a scholarly association's boycott resolution. All the institutions of state maintain ideological and material devotion to Israel, administrative offices, law enforcement agencies, legislative bodies, the argument that Zionists repeat about campus being awash in anti-Israel and thus anti-Semitic sentiment is a fantasy, or more precisely, a rhetorical gimmick to convey a more critical point, that challenging their supremacy is a form of prejudice. Humor my self-indulgence for a moment. I want to consider what that word Freedom means in economies structured to reward obedience. No thinking person buys the myth of merit as an explanation for wealth or upward mobility. Academe and corporate media are filled with mediocrities who achieve stardom by flattering the ruling class. Already then, 
Freedom is tenuous because livelihood is contingent on respectability. It's self-contingent on whatever version of exceptionalism pleases a local elite. Cultures of online exchange promise a kind of freedom, but more than anything, they illuminate the preponderance of coercion, it, a much greater social force. Nobody who covets white-collar stability will make a comment on social media without considering specters of recrimination, if only in a hypothetical future. Every hiring committee you'll ever encounter staffs Twitter's electronic panopticon. Once a narrative about an academic's offensive social media profile takes hold, it becomes a permanent demerit. Because I was marked in a particular way, deliberately and publicly, I cannot visit Palestine, my mother's ancestral land, as the Zionist occupiers control all ports of entry. I can't find a single university president who will affirm my right to extramural speech. I can't get an office job with any campus or corporation that has access to Google. I've been sued two different times by the same people who wrecked my academic career. Civil liberties can offer recourse against governmental repression, but they're helpless against the capitalist impulse to eliminate disruption of commerce. Tell me then, what opportunity, what autonomy, what freedom? I'm not sure anyway that it's wise or accurate to limit academic freedom to a narrow civic imperative. Academic freedom exists in countless relations of power which render it dynamic and inconsistent. The primary muscle behind academic freedom, in the USA at least, are courts and labor unions. The AAUP, for example, functions as a union on various campuses including the American University of Beirut where I worked for two years. Unions have a mandate to do more than observe and, and document violations of academic freedom. They attempt to strengthen faculty governance, which is obliged to serve the interests of underrepresented students and instructors, along with fighting the growing tide of precarity. I don't think faculty governance even where it still enjoys some autonomy, adequately does these things, but we're talking about hypothetical transactions related to academic freedom. It's not at all clear then that concern with justice is beyond the purview of academic freedom. As to the courts, they can sometimes provide recourse, but we should consider the timing of litigation and the nature of the restitution it offers. Upper administrators certainly consider these things. When a professor generates controversy, university leaders will undertake a cost-benefit analysis wherein they measure the damage from a broken contract or violation of academic freedom against the losses they might incur from unhappy donors or politicians. In my case with Illinois, administrators and politicians represented the interests of wealthy investors. I sued and the courts, as the university's leadership knew would happen, because they said so in private emails, took my side. Academic freedom provided recourse. Case closed, right? Not quite. No amount of money, no legal recognition that I was wronged will replace the loss of my academic career, to which I devoted the majority of my life. There's no such thing as becoming whole when the state that destroyed my livelihood tries to return it in piecemeal increments. Academic freedom can't make any university hire me, no matter how strong my CV. It can't alleviate the fear administrators have of upsetting the Israel lobby. It can't alter the ideological conditions that make campus so hostile to Palestinians. Everybody involved in the imbroglio at Illinois got to pick up the pieces of their vocation and move on to different pastures. I didn't. The fallout for me was permanent. They can put the ugly situation behind them. It's always right in front of me. I think about these things when I'm inspecting my school bus in the dark of a 20 degree morning.
I've been discussing the variability of academic freedom as both a discourse and a practice, basically the ways it can be instrumentalized in service of various ideological projects. One example involves the University of Cape Town. When your university senate passed a resolution ending collaboration with Israeli universities engaged in gross human rights violations, in March it set off a flurry of disapproving and often reproachful commentary from Zionist scholars. Most of them, not wanting to betray partisan motivations, disapproved of the resolution by citing academic freedom. Leaving aside the demonstrably false notion that boycott and civil rights are incompatible, they have historically gone hand in hand, the partisans pretending to be objective relied on troublesome assumptions about the range and purpose of academic freedom. First of all, the decision was made according to a democratic governing process, so it represented a classic example of academic freedom in action. What then are critics of the resolution actually doing? What do they truly want beyond the piety and the platitudes? They're asking upper administrators or outside forces to intervene in faculty governance based on political displeasure, the very thing academic freedom is supposed to prevent. Moreover, what vision of academic freedom are the critics promoting? Working outside the boundaries of state power in order to defend the disenfranchised and dispossessed after having exhausted the possibility of change through conventional channels embodies the sort of public engagement that university PR departments relentlessly market. Yet the detractor's conception of academic freedom, one deployed to dissuade or shut down extracurricular activism, tacitly and sometimes openly encourages sites of authority to regulate ideas, to mediate which of them become normative, and to subdue activism with potential to disrupt extant structures of power. Those who oppose BDS don't simply abjure radical discourses, they deploy an iteration of academic freedom that serves managerial interests. Ac <laughs> academic freedom is always conditional on a corresponding politics always conditioned by the issues with which it corresponds. We can't treat it as timeless or discreet. Rights pretend to be neutral entitlements, disbursed according to need. In fact, they are commodities, managed by bureaucrats paid handsomely to indulge the ruling class under the guise of collective values. Mainstream debates about BDS disappear people at the heart of the issue. Almost exclusively, conversation, conversations about academic boycott describe the ways it might harm Israelis, none of which has come to fruition. But what about Palestinian students and scholars? This question always comes out of nowhere because Palestinians aren't part of the calculus. The moment we decide that they're worthy of academic freedom, that is, to the promise of movement and development and interchange, to an existence that isn't criminalized, to lives of inquiry unfettered by suppression, boycotting Israeli universities becomes the only ethical response. It shouldn't be surprising that some advocates of Palestinian liberation express skepticism about the prospects of academic freedom in the corporate university. Recrimination against anti-Zionists on campus is a bona fide phenomenon. It's been happening for decades. Professors are fired or arrested. Some have been deported. The lucky ones merely suffer alienation, ignominy, and abuse. Students are profiled as terrorists on websites intended to harm their career prospects. Management shuts down clubs devoted to Palestine. Outside of leftist and civil libertarian spaces, this stuff is mostly ignored. 
What should be a continual scandal generates attention only when there's opportunity to situate Palestine as a strange, aggressive geography. Dozens of pundits have made lucrative careers of defending free speech as if it's a neutral phenomenon, an approach that inevitably benefits the political right because neutrality, in essence, is the logic of power. Those pundits never invoke Palestinians as victims of the repression they deplore. I hope that my focus on Palestine isn't out of place in Cape Town. I'm recalling the deep and lasting ties between the anti-apartheid struggle and Palestinian nationalism and want to give a nod to the people of this nation who have been unflinching supporters of Palestine's liberation. South Africa has always been a source of strength in our imagination, a place where solidarity goes beyond narrative to achieve an existential kinship that comes to us in tableaus of emotion. The large statue of a triumphant Mandela in Ramallah is a gift of steadfastness, of what we call samud, to a people still suffering a regime of racial segregation. The examples of Palestine in relation to academic freedom aren't isolated to a particular geography. We need only consider the imperatives of any localized ruling class to see the situation repeated across the globe. All states harbor communities whose desire to survive threatens the supremacy of individuals and institutions invested in their dispossession. In a world of ascendant fascism, we can't simply accept academic freedom as a given, nor is it prudent to imagine academic freedom as a constant amid curricular and pedagogical changes. Threats to academic freedom coincide with ominous prospects for biological and ecological survival. Academic freedom can't exist without the very forces it opposes. It is at once sovereign and derivative. Raise a revolutionary politics, one that stresses the violence of colonization and capitalism, and you'll quickly encounter the limits of civil liberties. The system crushes substantive dissent with or without them, even if it has to spend a bit of money or face a few days of acrimony on Twitter. It's important then to avoid treating academic freedom as sacrosanct and view it instead as a participant in material politics. Academic freedom cannot function without tenure, worker solidarity, and an adequate job market, which are increasingly in decline. Can academic freedom be saved is perhaps a less pertinent question than is there any longer a marketplace for academic freedom? The corporate university is disarming academic freedom by diminishing the circumstances in which it can be effective. Let's not shy away from the complicity of the tenured professoriate in the sorry state of affairs that now affect the global academy. Tenured positions are down. Government funding has decreased. The managerial class is a bloated monstrosity. Some instructors work multiple jobs without adequate benefits. Sexual violence is common. Racism appears poised for another golden age. The humanities are barely surviving. Student debt is outrageous. And those with job security did little to prevent any of it. This is the kind of comment that gets me into trouble. <laughs> what evidence is there for the claim, tenured faculty will want to know? Well, my evidence is simple. Everything on the list occurred while you were on the clock. Their occurrence creates a paradox for anybody who would disavow responsibility. You either claim helplessness, in which case academic freedom is unnecessary, or you acknowledge that academic freedom is a limited commodity available to those who enjoy some level of institutional power. I was a tenured faculty member for 12 years and count myself among the complicit. I didn't do nearly enough to support my contingent comrades because I didn't properly see them as comrades, something my position informally demanded. And trying to produce meaningful criticism put me in serious conflict with my employers. 
We all know in personal moments of brutal honesty that radical devotion to lesser classes is almost always just professional branding because we're scared of the punishment that awaits if we offend the wrong people, those who occupy floors above the ivy. Academic freedom doesn't take away the fear because we know that management can always find a way around it. The problem ultimately isn't individual, though. Professional associations talked a lot about this crisis or that emergency, but did little to organize their members. Departments and colleges consented to divide and conquer strategies rather than uniting across disciplinary boundaries. Prestige triumphed over solidarity. Now the damage may be irreversible. I can be accused of speaking from a sense of pessimism cultivated by ostracization. I accept that criticism. I'd respond by pointing out that useful critique often comes from people who suffer the worst tendencies of a culture or a profession. I can't feign objectivity or claim to speak for any collective. Academe is a large profession with thousands of disciplines and subcultures. Its inhabitants have vastly different experiences and impressions. But this much I know. My ouster from academe brought into focus problems I scarcely noticed when I was on the inside. College students often talk of unlearning the dogmas they internalized from their homes, secondary schools, and places of worship. Well, I'm constantly unlearning the strictures of being learned, exercising the finely tuned customs of obedience into which I and my peers were so carefully socialized. Now I instantly recognize when putatively radical scholars reproduce the imperatives of power through a compulsion to find nuance where old-fashioned outrage is appropriate. I've talked longer already than I'm normally comfortable doing. I don't want to stretch the limits of your patience, so let me try to synthesize a central point to, to all of this philosophizing, reflection, storytelling, whatever you want to call it. If you're interested in a revolutionary politics, by which I mean if you harbor a desire to subvert or at least alter the structures that govern inequality, then academic freedom will neither offer guidance nor protect you from recrimination. This isn't to say that academic freedom is unimportant. It is critical to a functional university. However, academic freedom shouldn't be an end in itself. It is an instrument, one among many, to help us realize a world unlimited by stagnant doctrines of pragmatism. Rehearsing the commonplaces of academic freedom isn't an adequate substitute for the uncomfortable inquiry it's meant to protect. Let us then imagine what a truly free campus in a free society would look like. Let us not wait for institutions to authorize our imagination. Let us create unsanctioned solidarities. Let us redefine disrepute. Let us harbor intellectual fugitives. Let us, above all, embrace the painful but liberating recognition that optimizing our humanity depends upon the obsolescence of civil rights, for they are necessary only in societies that profit from repression. My son just finished First grade, yes, we've, we've reached the, he's talking about his kid portion of the, the, the lecture. Um, it, says, you know, it happens, it's inevitable with me. Um, the only time I know freedom is in his company. He hasn't yet discovered the enervating logic of civility. We've spent this summer up in the northern hemisphere searching the woods for railroad tracks, watching uneducational cartoons, and creating a ruckus at our community pool. It was hard as hell to pry myself away from this routine, even though I'm happy to have visited. My, my experience of this beautiful city has been cathartic. But he started playing baseball in April. 
in South Africa, you'll know baseball is the completely watered down version of cricket. Um, you know, that's, it. That's, that's how I understand it. That's how I understand cricket, actually. You know, it's a... now, I want to say he took to the game like a natural, but the sport doesn't agree with his body. He's, he's a gangly kid, unusually tall. He's been in the 99th height percentile since birth, and his attitude was lukewarm, too. He liked batting. What child doesn't like carrying a big stick? But in the field, mostly devoted himself to skipping in circles and kicking up dust. At the end of my afternoon shift, I'd park my bus and rush across the lot to my car, speeding away in order to make practice on time, two, sometimes three times a week. There I sat on a grassy hillside and watched my boy run and smile, and I'd remember the meaning of freedom, not as a term, but a feeling, its most essential incarnation. Not even striking out repeatedly while his teammates became power hitters quelled the child's enthusiasm. He'd miss the third pitch, glance bashfully in my direction, and then bound behind the backstop to retrieve his glove. The failure became my burden. During games, I stewed in tension as the ball flew past his bat, standing to clap and shout, good job, as he scampered to the dugout, his bat dragging behind him. With only two games left, I took him to an empty field to practice swinging. The day was humid, and neither of us wanted to be outside. For the first time, I could see that striking out was bothering him, and I wasn't sure what it meant that it had occurred in my company. He bang, began connecting with the ball, dinks and foul tips. It was enough for him. He wanted to visit the mall or watch TV, anything that would get us out of the sun. I pressed him to continue. The practice will pay off during the game, I kept saying. My tone excitable, my body language impatient. It'll pay off. He dutifully continued swinging. At the game the following day, there was no change in his gait or demeanor as he approached the plate. Three pitches, three swings, three misses. <laughs> I searched his face for signs of disappointment, but he carried his normal expression of wonderment. I suppose I needed to search my own face to, to find the sentiment. About five minutes later, he had sneaked beside me on the bleachers. I turned my head and there he stood. Startled, I asked what was the matter. He beckoned me to lean closer. When my ear was an inch from his mouth, he clasped my shoulders. Papa, he whispered, it didn't pay off. <laughs> <laughs> he slid onto my lap. I took off his cap and tussled his hair. You did great, I reassured him. He returned to his teammates, to the field where he did pirouettes at the edge of the outfield grass, to the place where he struck out two more times before picking up a paper bag filled with snacks and a bottle of Gatorade. All seemed normal on the ride home, but I was in turmoil. It was hard for me to believe that my child's visit to the bleachers wasn't motivated by a sudden loss of innocence, by a terrible recognition. The rewards that are supposed to come of hard work don't always materialize. It must have been confusing for him, but it wasn't a bad lesson, I figured. We all learn it at some point, perhaps with the exception of those born into wealth. And it's no accident that those types are most apt to aggressively defend capitalist myths of upward mobility. In time, I realized that I had learned something too for five years. Almost exactly five years to this day, I've had to consider whether my sharp criticism of Israel and subsequent recalcitrance, the unwillingness to grovel my way back into academe's good graces, were worth it. But it's been almost impossible to understand the stakes because the story is un ongoing. It's plot out of my control. I wouldn't change anything, nor do I entertain regret Still, the decisions I've made will feel incomplete, disaggregated, until the situation on which I commented ceases to be catastrophic. All I know is that I'm determined 
to keep alive the idea of freedom. If I back down from a dangerously simple vision of Palestinian liberation, one intolerant of anything less than, in, than equality, then I will have betrayed the people with whom my destiny is aligned. Objects of disrepute in the white collar economy, unwelcome proof that greed has real life consequences. I endure the punishment, not because I'm a sucker or a martyr. I have no illusions about the ruthlessness of capital and I despise lionization of public figures. But because I want the vision of freedom ubiquitous among the dispossessed to survive. I dislike it when activists and intellectuals in the metropole compromise that vision for the sake of access, market share, or respectability. Likewise, when they accommodate Zionism in order to sanitize the image of Western politicians. These actions aren't necessary compromises or reluctant overtures to realism. They're voluntary acts of conciliation. Worse, that conciliation proceeds without the consent of people the activists and intellectuals purport to represent. No matter how much punishment I suffer, I will never abdicate my commitment to human beings dismissed as surplus, devo devoid of influence, unloved by power. That's how we win. That's how the downtrodden have always won, every single time, by defying the logic of recrimination, by depleting its power through unapologetic defiance. That's why they hate me, because I'll face down any punishment they decide to serve, because I won't ratify their defamation, because I'll never compromise the humanity of the Palestinian people in order to assuage a colonizer, we have to be willing to drive buses, sweep floors, stock groceries, wait tables, to do the kind of labor that frees the mind from exploitation of the body. Whatever keeps the idea alive, that's our greatest source of power. Something basic to survival, something so damn simple. The goal shouldn't be to build an audience, to humor arbiters of respectability, to craft ideological brands, to make good money. No, it should be to inoculate yourself against the malice of your oppressor. They took my career. They continue to patrol academe to make sure I never return. That's why they're complaining about my presence here at UCT. They're sending a message. Don't even dream of hiring this guy. Don't even consider it. We'll create a circus, a rag bag of bad press, the one thing that administrators of all ideological leanings dread. We'll withhold donations. We're willing to harm the entire institution in order to preserve our anachronistic politics. I know this because they do the same thing at every campus I've ever visited. Why should they complain about BDS? Are they really worried about academic freedom? Every attempt to hire me, a project that's supposedly the autonomous domain of faculty, meets with remonstration from the outside. In fact, they intervene before employment is even an idea. And for what? Viewpoints with which they disagree. They have no standing to cite concern for academic freedom not while they reproduce the textbook behavior of its historical enemies. They took my health insurance. They keep dragging me into court. They forced me into hourly labor. What do I have left? The one thing they can't extinguish, a fixation on equality recorded in steady rhythms with an uncapped pen. In other words, freedom. Don't ever voluntarily cede that power. Your recalcitrance will pay off. And then we'll join the continents in victory. The system of compensation into which we're acclimated can never match that kind of reward. Here is the problem with orthodoxy. Here is the moral limit of pragmatism. Institutions wring humanity out of social relations, and so the indescribable closeness of filial love, 
in whispered exchanges of hope and anxiety becomes a lifeline to meaningful futures. I don't want to conceptualize justice as an attempt to curtail our worst tendencies, but as a disposition that reproduces the imperatives of filial love in spaces of mercy and compassion. Recalcitrance is our only source of power against a voracious ruling class, being recalcitrant, a refusal to passively consume injustice as a matter of economic or psychological expedience, is worth the hatred and suffering it generates across the political spectrum from the fascists, the bosses, the racists, but also from the self-described paladins of justice with bureaucratic aspirations, those who expect makeshift devotion to immediately pay off. I want to take up residence with you in a world of impossible ideas. And the main idea we must nurture isn't academic freedom. It's simply freedom, unadorned, unmediated, unmodified. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> he warned me before and said, um, you know, in answering, he might take longer than um, we can manage uh, in order to release you in time to uh, get to supper at home. <laughs> so I'll take uh, three questions uh, to start off with, and hopefully we'll have a second round. There's a hand at the back. My question to you is, you remain so composed and collected throughout your thing. And as an audience, I found it incredibly kind of, I couldn't even process. Someone has gone through so much. And where do you really get this inspiration? And how did you really manage to process so much? And especially when you talk about your family and child, which is very close, personal. So where do you draw this inspiration from? That's the question to you. Uh, thank you. It's a very, very beautiful uh, presentation. And actually, I'm seeing you are not alone. I'm born in Iran and grew in Iran. I just came here for my PhD. Iran, did you say? Iran, yeah. Okay. There are 80 million people there. They have been in the same condition as you because basically our country is not accept Israel as a country. Uh, because as is not accepting South Africa as a country when it was under apartheid. Then... That's why they don't like Iran, and they're putting sanctions, leaving there over 40 years of sanction when the, after the revolution, the system do that. And people are suffering them. A lot of people now they're tired because it's full of sanction, and they're questioning why our country have to do that. We all suffer. Then it's not an easy decision. That's why a lot of people, if you not think deeply that what those people, the power is, it means that even if you are alive, you have to be very happy because when they can do that to the big country with 80 million people, what they can do to the one individual. Yes. But thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very uh, strong and very hard hitting uh, lecture as well. Thank you. I have a question. I mean, maybe if you have some reflections on, uh, on how perhaps, I mean, I think the distinction you make between academic freedom and, and freedom. Uh, it's, it's, it's very powerful. And I was thinking about how, you know, reflections or at least historical reviews of, uh, of, of naming something like academic freedom. In South Africa, we have a very clear sense, for example, that, you know, that this moment, that there were certain moments in the history of South Africa when academic freedom was very important. And 
would you agree with that or would you say that is something of a misnaming? So we've had two questions and a comment, so we'll accommodate the third question from the front. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very enlightening. I just wanted to question, sort of get your personal opinion on how legitimate you believe institutions like these are, given the fact that they're only available to a select amount of people from the general population. And in terms of those who live in places that are siloed from active spaces like these, how effective is the contribution that academics and students make in pushing the agenda forward in terms of getting more freedom? Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, um, I, I jotted it down, but um, I'll a a answer in, in reverse order. And if, if I've missed something or forgotten something uh, that anybody has asked, uh, please, please let me know. Um, thank you for the kind words. I'm, I'm starting with the question about the legitimacy of institutions like, like UCT and, and what social function they, they can serve in uplifting a, a society. And that's a really good question. And it gets to the heart of the matter. Um, d despite uh, what you might call a, a, a pessimism that, that I've uh, cultivated based on recent experiences in, in academe and then uh, subsequent observations about academe, I still um, maintain a, a steady belief in the importance of, of institutions like this um, to you know, educate as much of the populace as possible, to intervene on the side of the downtrodden in, in policy debates to serve, at least to some degree, as a conduit between the people and, you know, and political, uh, and, and political decision makers. Um, getting a university to operate in the way that I've just described, though, is remarkably difficult when the university is also dependent on the state and, and corporate donations in, in order to survive. So I think that looking forward at the prospects of, of universities such as this and, and, and those around the world, it, it seems super important that students who have their entire futures in front of them and are therefore invested in this issue in a particular way and continue raising their voices on campus, continue communicating with, with your professors and, and campus leaders, tell them what kind of vision for access to this institution that you think would make a difference to people in this country and elsewhere who have normally been excluded from, from spaces of elite education. Um, I think it's also up to the faculty to keep that, uh, that kind of ethic in mind that in the end we, we don't exist at, at the behest of a set of credentials, but we exist at the behest of the students and the people of the society that the inst whose interest the institution is supposed to represent. But it's a challenge. It's a challenge primarily because of money and because of political influence. I can't speak to the, the specifics of UCT and, and Cape Town and South Africa more broadly. I, I know virtually nothing about any of those three things, but as a general observation, it strikes me as really important that students and faculty and community members are all invested in democratizing campus spaces and making sure that actual access is granted and not just to take a few pictures and, and put them on the website you know, of, of diverse people celebrating, right? But that that access is real and that the universities continue making inroads right, into communities that normally have been excluded from upward mobility. The universities, I optimally, and this is the way that most of them started, right? or many of them started anyway, they should optimally be a central part of a, a project of nation building, right? And and South Africa is is relatively young 
right, in the era uh, uh, after apartheid, right? It's a relatively young anti, uh, unapartheid state, and so there's still plenty of nation building to be done, and the university needs to play, right, and the people in the university and affected by the university need to play a central role in that, right? So they, it cannot close itself off to, to a set of, of elite concerns or, or pander to the, the narrow whims of donors because those classes are always gonna be interested in, in reproducing the status quo that, that serves them rather than, than, than serving you know, the entirety of, of the nation. I told you I talked too long. Uh, I'm, and uh, the, the naming of academic freedom, I don't know, I mean, that's, that's a great question. And I'm responding to the gentleman's question about, uh, you know, how academic freedom is, is named and how that might perfect, uh, reflect its uh, performance or, 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 or our understanding of it. You know, just, it's the same really as, as civil rights or civil liberties or, or free speech. It's very easy to, to get caught in, in the muck of, of, of definitions. I, I, I just did the same thing like half an hour ago, so I, I can't really condemn anybody for doing that. But um, I, I think rather than thinking about the way that it's named and understood, I think it's, it's more important, no matter what we end up calling it, to constantly interrogate how it, it performs in actual sites of material politics. And that, that's the problem that I normally see, that people want to flatten free speech and academic freedom as if it's a disinterested phenomenon that, that applies to everybody, but it strikes me as more important to think through to whom, um, as the Vice Chancellor was saying in her introductory comments, in fact, right, who has access to it, right, uh, uh, who gets protected by it, who tends to be excluded from it, and those are superb, superb bellwethers for figuring out the social position of, of different groups within any given society. If you look at, at who tends not to be protected by academic freedom, then you've understood a whole bunch immediately about their social relations with the state and with other communities in the state. Um, about uh, Iran, I, um, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. This is the gentleman who, who talked about um, all of Iran suffering sanctions because of its uh, non-normalization politics with, with Israel. I mean, I can say that, that people in and beyond Palestine are, are you know, despite a range of political views, uh, grateful to those states that, that refuse to normalize with, with Israel. We're very upset with states like the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, who, who are in fact normalizing now. Um, Egypt, Jordan, um, who are developing relations, not just economic relations, but military relations in, in a lot of cases. And so as tough as it is for the people of Iran, and we as, as Palestinians cannot dictate to the people of, of Iran what they ought to be sacrificing, I, I'd say that it's important also to keep in mind that if Iran drops that particular policy and ingratiates itself right, into the good graces of the Western imperial powers, right, then a different kind of suffering will result. Right, that inequality will become even more vast, that you're gonna have the hands of, of foreign capital, U.S. capital, so deeply in your economy that you're never gonna lop them off. <laughs> They're gonna be there forever, all right? And uh, you can just look at that, what's happened in most countries in, in Latin America. So I, 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 I empathize with and feel for the people of, of Iran and Syria and, and uh, other nations that suffer from U.S. sanctions, which tend to be barbaric, right? Uh, Iraq suffered under them for, for many, many, many years. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a horrible phenomenon, but the alternative is sadly not much better, if not worse, right? And that becomes, a, then the alternative meaning becoming a client state. For, for, for the U.S. That, that has never worked out for anybody but uh, um, a local native ruling class. And then finally, where the inspiration comes, I see this is the kind of question where my inspiration comes from that you know, I'm gonna talk about for the next year, but I'm gonna make it simple. Uh, um, it, it really, people think that I'm a monster because of, of, of my Twitter comments, but really I'm just, I'm not like that, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not, I, I don't know, I just, you know, but 
you know, my, my parents raised me to be polite. I don't know what to say, uh, I, you know, but, but I don't, you know, what I do on Twitter is part of a social media persona that we all have and that we all cultivate. But in the end, I like to connect with people. I, 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 like, I like to say things that, that perhaps have meaning for people and then they tell me things that have meaning in return and, and that's how we build these really wonderful relationships where I'm able to better empathize with them. That I don't, I wouldn't know really anything about the world had I not my entire life or my entire adult life anyway, hadn't taken the time really to, not just to hear right, what, uh, what black people in the U.S., what native people in the U.S., what immigrants in the U.S. were telling me, but try to understand what, what they were telling me. And, and, and I love that as a basis for conversation. And, and I, I, I do, in, in my private life, I'm, I'm deeply hurt and, and upset about where my life ended up. But in the end, I, I feel like you have to take it on the chin and keep going because it's the idea. And no idea worth believing in has, has, has ever sustained itself to the point of freedom without a lot of people suffering. And through really no choice of my own, I ended up being one of those people. But th there are plenty of others who are suffering much worse, and so I take inspiration from them. You know, from the dispossessed, from, from the powerless, I see the images from Gaza, just like you know, many of you do, and, and I mean, those children you know, who are suffering and being shot at and being half starved to death, man, they fill me with life. You know, and if they have the strength to do it, certainly I have the strength to do it, right? And, and that's, that's why I don't like the lionization of public figures. You know, the, no, there, there's real bravery happening all around us. You walk outside of this campus and look around and you'll find it. And, and that's where I try to, to keep my attitude and it helps keep me centered. Sure. Um, it's a pity that uh, time we cannot control. We have run out of time. Uh, so I hope uh, I'm not disappointing too many of you uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to ask Stephen a question or share a comment. I understand that there is an, an engagement tomorrow um, in the Department of Religious Studies. Uh, it's an open uh, engagement. Uh, it's it starts, at five. It starts at five. So if you want uh, to have more of Stephen, uh, <laughs> do <laughs> use that opportunity. Um, it's been an inspiring uh, lecture and uh, a lot for us to think about, a lot of work for us as a new democracy. Um, and in line with what the Vice Chancellor has said and what uh, Steve has reiterated, we must not forget that we are still in a nation building state. As long as we take each other along and in ways that we engage with others from the continent, the rest of the continent, and elsewhere in the world, um, that we remember that uh, through solidarity, we can engage vicious dominant power. I am left only with thanking Stephen and uh, offering him a gift from UCT. I'm sure it's something that is safe to take. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone and safe drive home. <laughs>